Hi, I'm Linda Holmes. It's NPR's Book of the Day. Jennifer DeLeon's young adult novel, Borderless, was partly inspired by controversies over zero-tolerance immigration policies that separate parents from children. In the book, Guatemalan-American author DeLeon writes about Maya, a teenager with a good life in Guatemala, who's forced to leave for the United States and is separated from her mother. DeLeon talked to Here and Now's Deepa Fernandez about the importance of telling an authentic story, in this case about people who leave, not because it's their dream, but because it's a necessity. Elsewhere, we've heard about President Biden's plan to increase the U.S. presence on the border ahead of the expiration of the Title 42 public health law, which allowed for the rapid expulsion of migrants without giving them the right to seek asylum. Title 42 is just one of the moves by the U.S. to restrict immigration over the Mexican border. Perhaps the most notorious was the Trump administration's 2018 zero tolerance policy, which empowered federal authorities to separate parents from their children. It's estimated that thousands have yet to be reunited. The policy inspired the new novel Borderless. The book centers around Maya, a young girl growing up in Guatemala with her mother. Though her life is a happy one, circumstances will force her to head to the U.S. border. Guatemalan-American author Jennifer De Leon is the author of Borderless, written for a young adult audience, though this adult really loved it. And she joins us in the WBUR studios. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. Jennifer, I want to start with what I loved most about your book, and that's the fact that your main character, a working class teenager, Maya, had a life in Guatemala that was full and rich, though not without struggles, but her struggles were also not unlike struggles of teens anywhere. And she had a passion for sewing, and she was at this fabulous fashion school, and I have to say her life almost felt enviable. And what struck me was it's not a portrayal of life in Guatemala that we see. And I wonder if that was a deliberate decision. Yes, it was. I really felt strongly about creating a character that defies what Chimamanda Adichie calls the danger of the single story. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to create this character who is nuanced and different and embodies a part of Guatemala that, like you said, many people don't often see. You grew up visiting your family in Guatemala a lot. And coming from America, I wonder, you know, how did your cousins and family's lives there seem to you? And did that impact your portrayal of this very ordinary life in a Guatemalan town? Absolutely. There are so many Guatemalan people who are not dreaming of coming north. They're not thinking about their great escape. I have cousins and second cousins who are very much rooted in their lives. You know, they're in law school or they are aspiring artists or they're training to become dentists and they play soccer. You know, it's just a full life. And again, it's not often what we think of when we have the image of migrants from Central America. Yeah. And Maya, your main character, really epitomizes that. She's a typical teenager. She lies to her mother. She sneaks around with a guy. Mm -hmm. But we also see that, like, she's a really good kid. She wants to do well in school. She wants to help her mother out. And then there's this underlying subplot that the guy she likes, who has been deported from San Jose, California, might be a gang member. I wonder if you can tell me about writing the relationship between Maya and this young man who was a deportee because it was far from a stereotypical portrayal of somebody who we think of as a gang member. I wanted to have some reality. There are many gangs in Guatemala, unfortunately, and people who are in the gangs, there are several reasons for joining. Oftentimes, they might not have a choice and they're forced to join. Oftentimes, it's a way of making money and having a sense of community. For yeah. Maya, she gets involved with him not knowing what's around the corner. Yeah. Well, we'll leave it right there because there's a lot right around the corner. <laughs> yes. Um, Let's talk about Maya's mother. She's a single parent, lots of love for Maya and protectiveness. And without giving too much away, when the mother and daughter arrive at the border with the U.S., the unthinkable happens and they're separated by immigration officials. And I have to say that was a huge stab to my heart that Mm. made the actual government policy that happened here really real. Mm. 
talk to me about writing kind of this real policy into your novel. Mm. Yes, the zero tolerance policy, um, it was like a thousand stabs in the heart. And every time I saw images of young children physically being separated from their parents, it was horrible. And at the time, I was very pregnant with my second son. And I remember looking at these images on screens and thinking, I just I just want to go there and help. I want to also go to rallies that are in the city. I want to march. And I was close to giving birth, and I could not do that. But I found that writing this book was my own way of marching, and it was my own way of fighting and using this art form to help bring awareness and to help make the images that people see on the screen real. Coming to the U.S. was never something Maya wanted, and that also seems like a departure from the narrative we get, that everyone's just, you know, hankering to come and live in the U.S. What do you think we just don't get about migrants and and why they come? Mm. I would say that I look to my own parents for the response to this question. For my father, not a day goes by that he isn't homesick for his homeland. You know, he really planned Mm. on coming to the United States temporarily. He came because he wanted to make enough money to buy a motorcycle. And um, my mother, on the other hand, really came searching for that quintessential, quote unquote, American dream to learn English, become a citizen, work hard, make money, buy a house, send her kids to college. And gratefully, they were able to achieve all of that. But it's complicated. You know, I don't think the average person in Guatemala aspires to leave their home unless there are forces really pushing them out. Yeah. You know, I want to just pivot a moment because listeners might remember the controversy around a novel called American Dirt that told a story of a mother and son escaping drug cartel violence in Mexico. It was criticised because it was an outsider telling essentially someone else's story. It was criticised for the tropes about Mexican culture. And the author said she was trying to give voice to a brown, faceless mass at the southern border. And critics asked why writers from the region were not given book deals to write a more authentic story. And... I have to say, Jennifer, I feel like your story here is what the critics were demanding, a real portrayal of the cartels and the gang crisis in the region, but without, I guess, objectifying it. I wonder how you see your novel in kind of this larger framework. I definitely see this book as a counter-narrative to the other types of stories, the stereotypes that we often see. And it's also a book that I hope allows people to see a window into the different factors that go into a person wanting to or needing to leave their home. It's easy to see Central American migrants, you know, in these caravans and coming to the border. And our own government leaders have said horrible things about Central American migrants. And for me, I'm just thinking about them as people first. And There's so much in the air with book banning and ethnic studies programs being slashed left and right. And so much of the reason for this is because these stories are powerful. There are studies that show that there's a a rise in dopamine when you listen to a story and that you remember it much longer than, you know, hearing a, a statistic or a percentage. And it's not that there isn't a place for that in the landscape, but I am a storyteller, I'm an author, and if I can use that to help somebody realize that this is just more complicated and that there's a lot of dignity in the people who are crossing, then I feel like I'm, I'm doing the work. You're right. Your story has stuck with me. And I want to tell you how much it stuck with me is that I live in Alameda, California, which is the East Bay. San Jose, California, where your character Sebastian was deported from, is not that far from me. And I kind of feel like I keep turning my head to see do I see Sebastian? Did he make it back? Oh, my goodness. Um, and I, So I want to ask you, are you working on a sequel? Because I'm desperate to know how my affairs and her mother and Sebastian. Oh, that is like the highest compliment any author can receive. That means that, that Sebastian is real to you. And I don't have plans specifically to write a sequel, but um, I definitely am working on, on my next YA novel, which um, is narrated by a group of young female soldiers um, in the 1960s in Guatemala Civil War. 
I just, again, want to give voice to a different part of history that's been traditionally left out of textbooks. Well, I'm going to keep looking for Sebastian in San Jose, and I'll tell you if I find him. Borderless is written by Jennifer De Leon. Thank you so much for stopping by to talk to us. It's completely my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.